Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Adapting Vermont's Forest to Climate Change. Our presenter today is Sandy Wilmot with the Climate Change Program at the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation. Sandy grew up in Vermont, attended the University of Vermont for a bachelor's degree in botany, and has a master's degree in forest entomology. She has worked for over 25 years for the state as a forest health specialist, focusing on long-term monitoring of forest health. The last seven years have included work on climate change, forest carbon, and adapting forests to climate change. Again, thank you, Sandy, for joining us this morning, and I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. Good morning. Adapting forests, it sounds a bit presumptuous. Can we really adapt our forests? Uh, what it really means um, is to use what we know about forests, about silviculture, about wildlife management, forest management, uh, and ecology to prepare them for a new climate regime. My presentation will uh, address the challenges, the choices, and the opportunities that are involved in adapting forests to this changing climate uh, and some communication skills um, that we are learning about how to talk about climate science to non-scientists. Uh, whatever your role is in, in the natural resource profession, uh, you really have an opportunity to talk to many people, um, colleagues and landowners, and taking these opportunities to discuss climate uh, and forest health will be really important to our overall goal. So you are on the frontier. Across the Vermont landscape, our forests are diverse. In the most recent inventory, uh, sugar maple was found to be the most abundant tree species. Uh, as you look across this list of species, think about each tree, where it grows, where it grows best, and imagine how it might cope uh, with increased temperatures with longer growing seasons, with flooding or drought, with storms or other disturbances. Factor in growth issues that aren't related to climate, and you've started the process uh, that you'll need to think about how climate threatens each species um, and how we can proceed to adapt our forests um, using what we know about tree species. So for sugar maple, the ideal growing conditions are more exacting than for beech or yellow birch or red maple. On this graph, you see for soil for fertility and soil moisture and where each of these species sort of fits in uh, in an illustrated way, how exacting they are and how, uh, how much they require in terms of soil moisture or fertility. This illustration is from Dr. Lee Allen and uh, it, it does show sugar maple really preferring those moist soils and good soil fertility. Uh, in a new publication produced by our staff, we researched the silvics of 30 tree species that grow in Vermont and identified the vulnerabilities that may lead them to be more or less adaptable uh, under new climate conditions. And this is part of that process that, that you all as uh, professionals will need to integrate into your own management planning, that uh, concept of species adaptability. Species and site conditions both need to be considered when planning for forest response to climate change. Uh, sugar maple trees growing in Essex County are going to be quite different uh, than tree sugar maple growing in Bennington County. 
Um, several years ago, our agency worked with uh, Tetra Tech uh, to assess forest vulnerability to climate change. We considered these three major forest type groups, uh, and the predictions were, as you might imagine, that the oak pine forests are most likely to be benefited through climate change and likely will expand northward. Northern hardwood forests will experience some compositional changes as species uh, adjust to new environments. Um, and these are likely to be most evident in southern Vermont. And the montane high elevation spruce fir forests, uh, especially in southern Vermont and, and the associated species uh, such as Bicknell's thrush, are probably our most vulnerable um, forest systems. Our Vermont work uses uh, global information about trends such as these temperature changes over the past decades. Uh, those areas that are uh, red are those that are uh, getting warmer in, in average temperature. And yes, these are broad mod models that we then downscale to, um, to pertain to our Vermont situation. Uh, and we use different scenarios for the future, such as whether we expect low greenhouse gas emissions or high emissions. Um, and so far, the, the high emission scenarios are unfortunately the ones that are holding true for our, our climate projections. Past trends in Vermont, um, for the last 50 years, the top graph shows average summer temperatures with centigrade on the left and Fahrenheit on the right. Uh, we see a, an increasing trend by about uh, 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So we've seen an increase of uh, about two degrees Fahrenheit over the past 20, uh, 50 years in our summer temperatures. And the winter temperatures are, are um, increasing at a more rapid rate, uh, about four and a half degrees Fahrenheit over this same period. Growing seasons also have increased in length, um, and over the past 40 years, we estimate uh, about two week difference in the length of the growing season as the freeze periods get shorter and the, the growing seasons get longer. And not only are the temperatures signaling change, um, but our trees are responding as well, as you see here in the earlier uh, sugar maple bud break since uh, the 1990s. And that earlier um, bud break can make things uh, be out of sync. Uh, we have early uh, late spring snows or frost that can affect uh, foliage and flowers. And while the leaves can recover on uh, and make new leaf, leaves flush out, the flowers and seed production uh, may be impacted. Uh, likewise, our falls tend to be later um, and that adds to the, the length of the growing season. Some species are going to benefit from this, uh, and unfortunately in that group are uh, many of our non-native invasive plants. We also have seen um, some extremely high temperatures in uh, March. This was in 2012. And the dark red colors are uh, 80 degree temperatures. So for four days, we had these very warm uh, March temperatures across the state. And um, we see a response in, 
in trees, uh, especially in Christmas tree plantations where there was um, where these trees took a hit. And across Vermont and New Hampshire, many of the Christmas tree growers um, saw some of this unusual tree mortality. The red colors are the, those growers where they, they were seeing uh, tree loss. Many healthy trees can uh, withstand adverse temperatures, uh, but in some cases where you have trees declining, uh, they can get pushed over the edge. And that was the case in 2012 with some areas of oak that had been defoliated, and uh, those trees never recovered. Likewise, we're seeing these storm events that, um, that are extreme, intense, and uh, in many cases pretty localized. Uh, microbursts are usually what they're called, and, and they're a downburst of strong winds associated with thunderstorms um, that, that are short in length but can be pretty intense and, and up to two and a half miles um, or less. And just because trees appear twisted after that uh, doesn't necessarily mean it was a tornado. Um, we have been seeing many microbursts around, around the state. So looking ahead to our projections, um, one example that I think gives, uh, gives us a perspective about where we're headed by the end of the century are these annual um, average temperatures uh, that, that show our, our temperatures changing to be more like those in uh, the southeast. Now, if you find yourself in the middle of a very cold winter, doubting uh, the client, the climate scientists. Uh, I just wanted to show you this this chart um, that uh, might help you understand and respond to some of those questions. Uh, on the top, you see January temperatures from uh, 2014. Um, which was very cold in our area. And as you can see, it's, it's showing uh, colder than, than the long-term normal. Um, but other areas of the globe are still quite warm. And if you come down to this graph, which uh, the zero is the normal for the 20th century, so you see colder than normal temperatures in, in the early 1990s. But we really have seen nothing like that um, uh, past about 1980. So globally, the temperatures are continuing to increase while we see some uh, local variation. And uh, the, the glaciers are melting if, if there's no other evidence. So this is our challenge. This is why we need to rise to this challenge. The climate is changing. There are force impacts, and there will be more. As professionals who care about our forests, who have the skills to, to manage these threats, who are used to thinking long term and dealing with uncertainty, you're the group who can make choices that will really make a difference in our forests. The latest national climate assessment, uh, which was, was the third climate assessment, um, confirmed that climate change is already affecting all the regions of the US. The president has taken actions to try to reduce greenhouse gas pollution um, and to prepare for these threats. Now, this interesting public opinion survey that I thought would, would help uh, address how to communicate to people about climate change. 
this poll said that more than half of American public believes weather in the U.S. has gotten worse over the past several years. 70% of people in the U.S. reported experiencing extreme weather in the past year, and this was done in uh, 2013. And 30% of those respondents had suffered harm as a result of extreme weather. Uh, that included high winds, rainstorms, and extreme heat. And half of, of the American public thinks it's likely that extreme weather will cause a natural disaster in their community in the next year. Those are pretty compelling uh, statistics for, uh, for buy-in about weather conditions. Um, climate change is huge. It's hard to talk to people about that. But everyone understands weather and the kinds of damage that it, it can do. So those are the challenges. Weather as we know it is changing. Climate change is, is a topic that's really huge, too big, big seemingly to address, um, but can be broken down into weather events that are more manageable. And the other challenge is that uh, what we know of as silvicultural outcomes are going to be different. Over the last five years, there's been a real blossoming of resources that are available about uh, forest adaptation. Um, the one that I feel is uh, very helpful is this uh, resource that was put out by um, the U.S. Forest Service called Forest Adaptation Resources, Climate Change Tools, and Approaches for Land Managers. It shows you a process that you can follow um, to integrate um, climate change and adaptation into your forest management planning. Uh, and here in Vermont, we can include uh, some additional resources that will help you draw from and use actions that are more relevant to Vermont. Um, but you'll still want some, uh, but what I was going to say is if, if you want some help in uh, running through this process uh, as a starting point, please let me know and, and I can assist you. Our Vermont guidebook, uh, which came out earlier this year, um, is on creating and maintaining resilient forests in Vermont, adapting forest climate change. And the purpose of the document is really to complement what is already done as part of planning and implementing forest management by providing suggestions on how to incorporate additional considerations for adapting forests. There's really four different um, ways that we have approached the, these strategies. Uh, first, there are sections on natural communities and how you might um, manage them in different ways. There are some strategies for addressing landscape of level adaptation, uh, working with forest blocks and connectivity, and there are strategies for operating within stands and taking into consideration um, changes in, in climate as you're, as you're doing operations. Um, we also have included silvics vulnerability and adaptive strategies for 30 tree species that are found in Vermont. Our Vermont goal really is um, to maintain a continuous forest resource. Uh, the composition of our forests will likely be different. Um, but to maintain all the values of our forests, the clean water, the wildlife habitat, the wood, the recreation, um, uh, we'll want to strive to keep that 
forest resource across our landscape. So if we want a continuous forest, we need to think about and be aware of the overstory trees as well as the regeneration needs. Um, species grow where the temperatures and moisture conditions are favorable and uh, the, the geography of species is different. Balsam fir is a cold loving more northern species whereas American beech can be found throughout the, uh, the um, east, east coast. So their, their adaptability to warmer temperatures and conditions is reflected somewhat in where they're currently growing. We especially want to look out for those species uh, such as balsam fir that um, are not favored for the future and come up with some strategies that can help maintain them on our landscape uh, for as long as possible. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on regeneration and regeneration requirements. Uh, we've been very fortunate in Vermont for, for the last century in that uh, trees just grow here. Uh, we don't have to plant a lot of trees. Natural regeneration, um, we, we rely on that. Uh, so in some ways we've become pretty complacent that we expect to see regeneration um, developing as we have in the past. But regeneration is really our future forest. Um, and if the young plants respond to climate change uh, in the same way as the overstory, then uh, we would expect to see the same species um, in the future. But if the young seedlings respond differently than the adults, then we're going to see a very different outcome. The overstory is the is the product of the past climate. And what we want to make sure happens is that we're thinking of the future climate when we're dealing with the, the next generation for us. So um, there's some excerpts from our climate change guidebook um, for, for white pine regeneration, a few things to consider. Uh, the cones mature in the August and September of the year following pollination, so that's a, a whole year um, of notice in terms of when you're going to get a good seed year. Uh, regeneration requires soil scarification. The first year seedlings are really highly susceptible to drought and they are not competitive. And it'll take about three or five years to establish that regeneration. So planning a harvest really should include planning for seed years um, and planning to uh, leave some sort of overstory until the understory um, gets established. Black cherry. Uh, doesn't begin producing seed until about 40. Spring frost can damage flowers. Um, a moist seed bed is required for germination. And shade uh, does improve germination rates. Um, it germinates very poorly in full sun. So the regeneration is going to be vulnerable to droughts um, as well as flooding. Uh, so removing the overstory before regeneration is established may really hinder success. So you want to make sure you're leaving legacy trees and creating canopy gaps where regeneration can, can get initiated. We don't think a lot about basswood. It's a minor component in our species, but it has some very, uh, very good 
uh, characteristics that make it a valued species, uh, especially for pollinators. It's one of the few tree species that has flowers that are visited by uh, a host of insects. Um, and it has a, a very, um, the, the foliage is very nitrogen rich, so it can replenish soil. So basswood um, has seed bearing, it doesn't begin to bear seeds until 50 to 100 years. So if we're not getting seed until a tree is 100 years, uh, does it make a lot of sense to remove that from the landscape? Maybe not. Uh, it does produce seed every other year. Um, seeds need a dormant period. Um, shading helps with, uh, with establishment, but in general, uh, it has a very poor germination rate. Sometimes higher soil temperatures um, in forest openings uh, can, can favor seedling growth. But given the uncertainty of regeneration success, um, basswood is one of those trees that if you have it, you should probably keep it. Now, in order for, for a good seed bed and a future forest, we need good site productivity. Uh, in, in the doc climate change document, um, there are a lot of suggestions on how to do this. Um, the complexity of our forest really makes it difficult to generalize, and, and not all recommendations are relevant to every site. Uh, but with higher temperatures and the potential for drier soils, maintaining and increasing the amount of organic matter on the forest floor is going to help retain water and nutrients. Um, so you should strive for an abundance of downwoody material and multiple layers of forest structure to shade soils. Uh, so how do, you, how do you increase the amount of organic material, uh, organic material being carbon? Leaving treetops after harvest is important to replenish the nutrients in the soil and some of the organic matter. But it does decompose pretty fast, and if you want to build up organic matter, uh, you need to leave large trees to fall and de decompose. Um, as you can see on this graph, um, small tree diameters have small amounts of carbon. Um, as they grow, they increase exponentially uh, in the amount of carbon that's stored there. So for every 10 trees that are 8 inches in diameter, uh, one tree of a 24 inch diameter um, is, uh, is about equivalent in terms of the amount of carbon. So how you do this uh, will be up to you, but in order to, to build organic matter, you need to grow big trees. Uh, it might be an extended rotation. It might be saving a few wolf trees. Uh, but bear this in mind, um, especially on those sites that are fairly unproductive. Um, it is a way to build up organic material. There's other forest health concerns uh, and climate does have a bearing on those, um, some more directly than not. Uh, in our guidebook, we've uh, included some information about specific management of non-native uh, invasive insects like the hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer, and the Asian longhorn beetle. And this web link here will direct you to specific uh, forest management recommendations. They will vary as insects move. Um, right now, we have hemlock woolly adelgid in the state, but not the other two, the other two pests. Hemlock woolly adelgid uh, has been found in southern Vermont, and it survives uh, during warm winters. Um, it can kill trees, especially when associated with hemlock 
scale, which has started to move into parts of, of southern southern Vermont. Another uh, consideration are the non-native invasive plants and how to manage them. If you operate in areas without plant pressure, um, count your blessings uh, and keep a vigilant watch for new plants. Early intervention is really essential. Invasive plants thrive in warmer climates. The list of reasons to avoid invasive species introductions is long. If you need an added incentive to be aggressive about managing invasive plants, just turn to tick control as another reason. Keep equipment clean. Search forest edges and waterways for new infestations. And work with landowners to really be vigilant about uh, non-native plants. There's a variety of pressures on regeneration, and they're becoming more and more urgent um, because of climate change. Regeneration failures where overbrowsing has occurred needs to be addressed. Um, there are some success stories. One strategy would be to work uh, towards improving hunter access in high deer density areas. Uh, connecting with land connecting landowners with hunters um, so that you can alleviate some of the browse pressure. Uh, leaving tops of trees over some of the desired species stumps to discourage seedling browsing is another possibility. Um, and in our guidebook, there's a, a long list of recommendations made by Fish and Wildlife. Um, as well as some of our, our foresters about dealing with, with deer pressure and resources that can help you manage those populations. So you have a lot of choices. And there are some tools out there that can help prompt you to think about and plan for them. This example is from uh, the, the Forest Service book. And it just, it, it provides you a framework for thinking about what are the issues you, you need to address in your management planning. Uh, sustaining fundamental ecological functions, reducing the impacts of all of these other biological stressors, uh, et cetera. And within that, you can um, think about what you're already doing and uh, fit it into these areas as a way to demonstrate that providing good forest management, uh, much of this you're already accomplishing uh, through that. So here's an example of uh, how you might document this. Um, this is from a, a piece of state land on Mount Mansfield under the category of sustaining fundamental ecological functions, we want to restore soil quality. So here are the things that are being done. We're retaining coarse woody material. We're harvesting in the winter, uh, increasing biomass retained on the site, uh, maintaining higher residual ba basal areas to uh, moderate temperature fluctuations for the soil. Um, and all of these things are, are probably um, intuitive to you, but being um, uh, by recording them and documenting them, uh, I think it will help you and, and the landowners really identify how you're already contributing um, to adapting for us. We don't do enough monitoring. And uh, how can we know what's changing if we aren't looking at um, uh, how, how our management is affecting for us? There will be surprises. In this case, this is emerald ash borer. We don't know where that's going to first appear and uh, how it may affect our, our forest landscape. 
but unless you're, you have specific um, goals for, for monitoring and looking at the trends in those forests, uh, you won't know whether your management needs adjusting or not. So using our guidebook, it sounds like I'm putting a plug for our guidebook, but there are a lot of materials in there that um, are very useful. For example, in the species section, uh, we look at each species, here balsam fir, we look at how, what are the positive attributes that this tree has under climate change. Well, it's well adapted to heavy snowpacks. What are the negative adaptation responses. It's on the southern edge of its range. It's susceptible to drought, especially during seed germination and establishment. Uh, trees are affected by balsam woolly adelgid, another non-native that does kill balsam fir trees. Um, it is uh, susceptible to wind throw. And using that information, how would you then adjust your silviculture to, uh, to promote uh, growth of this species? And we go through some, some suggested silviculture, light thinning to maintain wind resilient stands, short rotations on appropriate sites to reduce decay, uh, small patch or strip cuts to keep soil moist for regeneration, and identifying uh, suitable sites for refugia, those really cold, moist pockets where balsam fir may be able to survive into the future. Uh, and finally, um, just a, another a uh, plug for our, our climate change document. It has strategies. It looks at, at climate impacts. It has concepts uh, about adaptation, building resistance, resilience, and assisted transitions. Uh, it provides you a framework to plug into, to think about climate change and incorporate into your management plans. And there are guidelines uh, for mitigating the effects of climate change and other stressors through your forest management. So the challenges are tremendous. There are choices. The choices um, are there to be made and involve a process of assessing each stand, each landscape, each planning effort with fresh eyes that see into the future the potential disruptions associated with our new climate regime. And there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's opportunities to communicate the message to landowners, to be proactive professionals who understand and respond to this threat. So be prepared. Be courageous. You are the Darwins in our modern age. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Sandy. <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, um, this is the time to, to go ahead and uh, enter those into either the chat box um, or the question uh, panel. While, uh, while folks are thinking of questions, um, I did want to alert you that I did add some resources that Sandy mentioned during the presentation. Um, so if you look at the, the panel on the left hand, excuse me, the right hand side of your screen, um, you'll see that there, the climate change report that Sandy mentioned uh, has been uploaded as a handout. Um, you should be able to download it from there. In addition, um, if you look in the chat box, I added a, a couple of other resources as well, uh, including a direct link to that report online, as well as a link to uh, VT Invasives and the Forest Health website uh, at Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. So I'll just go ahead and give it another minute here and see if uh, any questions come in. I think uh, Sandy just must have done such a good job of covering everything that uh, it doesn't look like we have too many questions. Absolutely no controversy on any of the topics, <laughs> I'm sure. 
I'll just reiterate that uh, I would uh, welcome you to, to call me or email me if you think you or um, uh, an association you're involved with would like uh, some assistance in going through the various documents and tools that are available and uh, figuring out how best to use them. So Sandy, there is a question from Bridget Butler. Uh, wasn't there a resource to match landowners with hunters? Is there a resource already? He, yeah, that's the question. Hmm. I guess I'm not sure about that, but I'll look it up. Yeah, I believe, you know, Bridget, I think that that was a program um, that was run with the, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, I'm not sure if there was a, a connection with your agency or with your department, Sandy, um, but I believe there is a program that uh, at least used to be in existence. I'm not sure what the status is of it now. If anybody knows the answer to that question, uh, feel free to type in information in the chat box. So uh, just to give folks another quick minute here to, uh, to enter in any questions, I'll go ahead and just let you know that at the end of the presentation this morning, you will be asked to follow a link to a very short evaluation survey. Please take the time to fill out the survey so that we can continue to improve and it'll help guide our future webinars and programming. In addition, um, many of you guys have asked, this webinar is approved for SAF continuing forestry education, education credits. Again, at the survey at the end of the webinar, there will be a place for you to submit your name and certification or SAF membership number. Um, please go ahead and complete that survey and enter that information into the survey um, so that we can go ahead and get you the appropriate uh, SAF continuing education credits. Also, I wanted to let folks know and put a quick plug in for our next webinar. Um, the next webinar is scheduled for October 21st at 9.30. We will be joined by Scott Darling with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department for a presentation on managing Vermont's endangered species. Specifically, uh, we'll be looking at some of the implications around the northern long-eared bat. Um, so please uh, stay tuned and, and uh, consider joining us for that webinar. Uh, you will need to go ahead and register for that webinar. Um, and so if you're interested for more information or to register, please go to the UVM Extension website uh, and again, click on the forestry uh, link. I'll just ask a couple questions um, since no one else is. Uh, are there topics you were hoping I covered that I did not cover? Uh, were there areas of this uh, presentation that were confusing to you that I could have explained more? Um, or uh, what do you think about talking to landowners about climate change um, by presenting it as uh, extreme weather events that, that are on the rise? So those are my questions. And again, as folks are thinking of a response to that, um, just a reminder, um, just to make sure that everybody has found the chat box, um, there there is a plus sign. And if you go ahead and uh, up on the left-hand corner next to the chat um, header there, and if you click on that, that allows you to expand that box. Um, and there's an area to type in text there, just in case you're having trouble finding it. So it looks like there, um, let's see here, uh, there are a couple of responses here. Um, <clears throat> looks like uh, there is a question from Robert. I apologize, I, I missed that, uh, that during the first round. Um, before we get into your second question there, Sandy, uh, or your, your uh, call for question for more information or for um, ideas from participants, let me just quickly pose this question to you. Why does it take five years to get timely temperature data? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't always take five years. <laughs> um, you can get climate information on an annual basis uh, through NOAA has a, a number of, of sites. Uh, I'm not sure where you looked to, to just get the five-year data, but um, give me a little more information. <laughs>
Well, it, it is a good question, Sandy, and you know, um, perhaps that's something that um, that that you can follow up, or Robert can follow up with you directly about. Um, you know, I think uh, in this day and age, it is sometimes hard to be patient, um, and it's clear that the amount of time and energy you've put into forest monitoring, um, you know, has really, uh, I think, laid a, a really amazing foundation for us to be understanding climate change here in Vermont. Um, so let's see here. Uh, there, um, let's move on to the, just a response to your question to participants, Sandy, about um, you know uh, other topics or items. Um, let's see here. There's a response from Bridget again. Uh, she'd like to see more on wildlife implications and climate change. Okay. Uh, I will mention that uh, Fish and Wildlife Department is incorporating uh, assessments of wildlife species in their new wildlife action plan. Um, and uh, I should have included some of that information here. So I will try to, to take heart and do a little more there. I'll also add here, um, you know, while, uh, while questions have been coming in. I did do some quick search um, around uh, some of the resources uh, Bridget had asked about the landowner program. I'm going to go ahead and send uh, a link to some more information on the Department of Fish and Wildlife's website um, that I think will have some, some more information on not only the landowner program, but also some of the other wildlife implications. Let's see, there's a response that says, I think that making the wildlife connections in these tree species that they rely on would be a motivator for landowners. Yeah. Uh, the Forester for the Birds program, which has really taken hold in Vermont and, and across the region, really, um, many of the, the goals for managing habitat for birds are the same kinds of goals that we would have for climate change. We want uh, diverse layers in the, in the forest, uh, you know, different structures that that provide habitat for different bird species. And uh, we have been talking with Audubon and some other people to try to incorporate some of the climate concepts into Forester for the Birds so that that, that same network of people that are interested in managing for birds can also uh, be covering some of our goals with, with climate change. And I just put a link to that website um, from Vermont Audubon in the chat box as well for folks who are interested in checking out that program. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, Sandy, uh, for, uh, for a great presentation this morning, and thank you, everybody else, for joining us. Um, we, uh, again, hope that you will consider joining us for our next webinar on October 21st. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.